The favorite mode of transportation for the lucky ones in Miami Beach is not parked in the driveway, but right here. The rest, well, they have to settle with driving BMWs and Mercedes. And speaking of Mercedes, we're in Miami Beach to check out a car that I never really have liked. It's the Mercedes B-Class. Even with prices between thirty dollars and $40,000, it has been called the poor man's Mercedes. Well, when it was originally launched, I think it was in 2005, my first question was, why? I never did get an answer, but maybe that will change as we check out the 2013 B250. The thing that I find most interesting is the B-Class has been relatively successful for Mercedes-Benz Canada. And really all it is is a small R-Class, which was phenomenally unsuccessful in North America. So why people have said, I like this in a small format, but don't like almost an identical vehicle in a large format is kind of, I find it curious. It's a bit of a mystery to me. The B-Class and that basic execution of the car, that hasn't changed with the second generation and that for Canadians, they want something that's useful, that has a utilitarian design, uh, but gives you the, the premium luxury features that our customers expect from Mercedes-Benz. So we can do that. We can give them a, a useful vehicle in a compact package, but still give them uh, a real Mercedes-Benz experience. The R-Class was basically a minivan. And the last one of the B-Class was a mini minivan. What they've basically done with this car, amongst other things, is take that whole platform and lower it some 50 to 70 millimeters, immediately eliminating the higher center of gravity. And so it handles a lot more like what a Mercedes should handle like. There is, however, somewhat of an anomaly, and it boils down to the sandwich-style floor pan. This thing, because it's like a sandwich, the step down to the road is further than you expect. Now, that's not so much a problem as it is an inconvenience. Our customers wanted uh, the, the handling of the, the original B-Class because of the sandwich construction was a little different than most of our other cars, so they wanted something that felt and drove a little bit more, uh, the handling experience a little bit more true to what our uh, other Mercedes-Benz vehicles give. So they've really taken that to heart. Our engineers completely redesigned the, the, the vehicle for the second generation. The powertrain is all new. Uh, the manufacturing platform is, is a more traditional uh, structure, so it handles very much like you would have uh, in our, uh, our C-Class and our GLK, that type of experience. Now, Mercedes says that B-Class buyers don't want an SUV. Fine, but people got to put their stuff somewhere, especially us on motoring. We don't travel light. And when we arrived in Miami, Mercedes says, well, just throw it all on the back of the B-Class. And we're like, I don't think so. Well, as you can see, not only did we get everything in the car, there was actually room for one person in the back. This is a, an all-new engine for us. It's a new two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder engine, so it's good for 208 horsepower, 258 pounds-feet of torque, so it's fantastically powerful. What we're really proud of is the fuel efficiency. We have a combined fuel economy of 6.8 liters per 100 kilometers, which not only uh, you know makes it stand out among the, the, the luxury crowd, but even you can look at uh, subcompact vehicles that have much less horsepower that get uh, that don't even get that kind of fuel economy. You're shopping for a Golf and you decide I want a Mercedes and you're willing to spend $2,500 to get the badge. That's what this is. What's the largest car market in the world? The United States, of course. So you'd think they hope to sell a lot of B-classes here, right? Wrong. In fact, this 250, as the previous one, will not be sold south of the border. The question is, why? I think the hatchback concept, maybe there's still a little bit of uh, trepidation in the U.S. market, but it's right for Canada. Uh, Canadians don't shy away from a, a design like a hatchback that's, that's a very useful vehicle um, that still allows it to be very dynamic and very sporty. So it's, uh, it's absolutely right for the Canadian market, even if, uh, even if the U.S. doesn't feel that way. I like the fuel economy uh, and the power. It's got a bit too much turbo lag. Uh, I think it's an extremely practical car. Obviously, there's people with just the right amount of money to be able to get into something with a Mercedes badge that also appreciate the utility. Is it the car that I would personally buy? No, but I see why other people would buy it.
we had the uh, the first B class for its whole life cycle. We will have this this B class for its whole life cycle as well. So this isn't a flash in the pan for us. This is something that's part of our long term growth strategy for sure. The pylon, you know, I've never been through a pylon course I couldn't see. And, and you know, Howard was perfectly right. We're going to be able to see the first two. After that, we ain't seen nothing. We're doing it all by memory. And he was exactly right. And at 20, we went through, I think, my fastest run in the truck. It was 33 kilometers an hour. Like most good things in life, if you want your fuel economy, you're just going to have to pay for it. More later on Kenzie's Corner. In 1993, Nissan replaced the Stanza with the all-new Altima. At the time, it was a very progressive move. However, between then and now, while the Altima languished and lagged its key competitors because of its boring styling and iffy materials. On this edition of Test Drive, the latest and fifth generation of the Nissan Altima. Throughout its life, the Altima has been a fuddy-duddy with a bland look and an equally bland drive. The combination did little to inspire the driver. Well, that has all changed with the introduction of the fifth generation car. It is now sharper to the eye. Some will say it looks too much like the larger Maxima, but you know that may just end up being its newfound ace. In the past, Nissan have used some pretty crappy materials in the Altima. This time around, well, it all changes. Most of the stuff is soft to the touch, the two-tone finish is very nice, and the piano black on the center stack adds a touch of class. It's also very logically laid out. Now, if you are in the market for an Altima, one option I suggest you take, the navigation system. The graphics are great, and it's very easy to punch in a destination. Yeah, $900 is a lot of money, but it's money well spent. When it comes to ride comfort, the Altima scores equally well. The front struts and multiple rear links do a good job of filtering out a rough road. Surprisingly, the compliant nature of the suspension does not hurt the handling. As soon as the suspension takes a set, the Altima carves a looping on-ramp with great precision. Push too hard and the 215-55R17 tyres do begin to slip into understeer, but it's a long way out. Similarly, the steering has a decent feel and the right sort of feedback. In this regard, it's one of the better family sedans. The back seat in this Altima is actually quite roomy. There's plenty of leg room. The seats sit up high enough off the floor. You've got somewhere to put your feet and sit in a third person in the middle position, albeit in a friendly manner, is not out of the question. The one thing that surprised me, there isn't that much headroom. <laughs> The Altima's base 2.5-litre four-cylinder is a solid engine. It puts out 182 horsepower and 180 pound-feet of torque, which is enough to give the drive an athletic feel. The four powers the Altima to 100k in 8.6 seconds, and it accomplishes the more important 80 to 120 passing move in 5.6 seconds. It also returned an average economy of 8.3 litres per 100 kilometres, which is pretty darn good. Mind you, if performance is more important than fuel economy, the Altima's 270 horsepower V6 is the right fit. The Altima's trunk will carry a family of four's luggage very easily. The 15.4 cubic feet of space is nicely squared off, and you can lock the seat backs in the upright position which preserves the security of anything that's valuable that's left in the trunk. So what's the hitch? Quite simply, when you fold the seats down, they do not go flat, and there's a ridge. Yes, it expands the length of the trunk, but it does little to improve the usable space. The only transmission available is Nissan's Xtronic continuously variable transmission. Under normal circumstances, I would launch into a rant about the motorboating that occurs whenever the driver gets into the gas with any sort of enthusiasm. True, pulling away smartly does see the Altima's tachometer sweep towards redline, but unlike so many engines teamed with a CVT, the Altima's did not produce the anticipated ruckus. I'm still not a fan, but I could live with it, especially when the sport mode is selected. Over the years, I've been nonplussed by the Altima. That all changes with this fifth generation car. 
Very nice interior, sharp styling, the handling ranks were the best in the segment, and in spite of the CVT, the powertrain is smooth and refined. It all left me wondering one thing, why would anybody upgrade to the Maxima? to present you, for the first time here in Canada, the 2014 Corvette Stingray. Corvette has been a part of General Motors for as long as anybody can remember. And whether we were going through the good time or the bad time, there's always, given, there's always been a Corvette. This C7 is the best car that we've ever done for Corvette. And we give it the name Stingray simply because we want everybody to know that it's extra special. And this car is everything that you can imagine. And we're not uh, worried about what the competition looks like or anything. We've made the right car. And uh, we've made it special. Therefore, we've given it the Corvette Stingray name. Hi, Kevin. Hey, Ron, how you doing? It's Ron Fellows. The only thing is, Kevin. Ronnie! I love you too, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> I think I need more seat time, but I need it to be on a racetrack. It's just amazing to see the response, the, the level of passion around this car at Corvette in general is phenomenal. To me, it's stunning. Um, I love the lines, and uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, when I my first look at it is, I'm, I'm envisioning the spoiler, the wing on the back, you know, the a little bit more bulge on the on the fenders for the for a little more downforce. Um, this thing, what's, what's it going to look like in race trim? Because it's, uh, it's always been for us on the racing side of it, a great baseline to start from. Ron Fellows is a icon in the eyes of Corvette and racing with Chevrolet. He is a consummate for professional and uh, he's been a part of the development of the Corvette for a long time. A special friend and we just thought that if we were going to do something like this, we needed to have Ron here to be able to uh, support what is the most special Corvette that we've ever made in history. Time is not on my side, and it's your fault. I'm Ted Laternas, and I'll tell you why at MotoringTV.com. As it turned out, as you mentioned, the car tend to polarize to a lot of ladies which was fine with us. The modern take on the car, the 21st century Beetle, is a little bit more masculine, shall we say. A new vehicle concept, the Trackster de Kia. We're so excited about it because it not only represents the spirit of the brand and how cool we've actually become, but it actually gives us hints of what's to come with our future soul, which is going to be released later this year. This particular model is equipped with a 250 horsepower, four-cylinder turbocharged two-liter engine. Um, it also has a Brembo performance brake package. We're actually at the tail end of our design-led transformation. So starting with the Soul in 2009, every vehicle that has uh, been launched uh, since has exceeded both consumer and our own expectations in terms of how beautiful uh, and compelling these vehicles are. The motoring tip of the week is brought to you by Walmart. For everyday low prices on Pennzoil, conventional and synthetic oils. Our motoring tip of the week concerns Zero W20 motor oils. Now there's nothing new about these motor oils. They came out with the first Honda Insight hybrid car and became the dominant oil on most other hybrid motor vehicles, certainly for lubricating the internal combustion engine in those hybrid cars. So we've seen them for a while, but if you're not familiar with hybrid cars, maybe you don't know about Zero W20 motor oil, and now you're starting to see Zero W20 motor oil spread into some very mainstream entry-level cars. Example, Toyota Corolla. This is the factory fill and the only recommended oil for the 1.8 liter engine in a new Corolla. So if you have a vehicle like that, you've got to make sure that you're topping up with the correct oil and at each oil change interval, you're using the Zero W20. It's a more expensive oil change and a more expensive motor oil, 
but it's not a big bump up in price, but it's a huge gain in engine protection, in fuel economy, and everything else that you're looking for out of that motor oil. So if your car takes this grade of motor oil, you don't have a choice between conventional or synthetic. You're automatically into a synthetic motor oil. And Zero W20 motor oils help to uh, enhance the fuel economy that engineers have built into your car because they reduce drag in the engine. Zero W20 motor oils are only available as a synthetic. There are no conventional oils in this SAE viscosity. That's your motoring tip of the week. By now, you probably realize here on the two minute test drive, we like to do things just a little bit different. On this episode, I thought we'd go big. And you know what they say, go big or go home. <laughs> This is the biggest and baddest truck on the planet. It's a 2013 International Lone Star, and this is... Hey, Russ, I'm the truck guy. Stick to your fancy sports cars. This is the two-minute test drive. This Lone Star comes in three variations, the day cab, low roof sleeper, or this high-rise sleeper complete with the top-of-the-line trim. Its turbocharged 13-liter diesel engine puts out 475 horsepower and an amazing 1,700 foot-pounds of torque. The transmission is a 13-speed manual, and as we can see, Russ has no idea how to drive it. I've never been through a pylon course I couldn't see. And, and you know, Howard was perfectly right. We're gonna be able to see the first two. After that, we ain't seen nothing. We're doing it all by memory. On its own, this Lone Star can average 12 liters per 100 kilometers of travel, and that's anywhere between 5 and 15 percent more fuel efficient than a traditional long nose truck. And that can equate to up to $5,000 of savings per truck per year. And what's amazing about this Lone Star is the size of this cab. It's huge in here, bigger than my first apartment. And that's all part of what drivers need on the road today. You need to be comfortable. It's quiet, it's insulated, it's heated, it's cooled. The seat has umpteen adjustments because a comfortable driver is a safe driver, and a safe driver means that everybody else on the road around him is gonna be safe as well. hard to see what's going on around you. Having driven that and know how difficult it is to see around it, you gotta remember we just had the cab. We didn't have the 53 foot trailer behind it. So if you're on the highways with these guys, give them a little bit of a break. I've driven a lot of trucks in my career. If I ever had to go back on the road, I think I'd enjoy driving the Lone Star. So long as I'm not sitting next to him. What are you talking about? He's Russ Bond, I'm Howard Elmer. This has been the Two Minute Test Drive. Closed captioning for Motoring 2013 is brought to you by Greener, Fuel Efficient, Global. This is Chevrolet Now, driving our world forward. The manufacturers of full-size pickup trucks are all talking about fuel economy. Ford's got their direct injection turbo EcoBoost engine. General Motors advertises the highest fuel economy for any V8 powered truck. And Ram, formerly Dodge, is bragging about 36 miles per gallon. Well, first of all, folks, we switched the metric about, I don't know, 40 years ago? Time to catch up. The thing is, anytime I see a pickup on the highway, it's always some 4x4 four four dually, and the guy's going about a buck 45. People who buy pickup trucks 
don't care about fuel consumption. They don't want to spend the extra money for these fancy engines anyway. You can buy a diesel engine for most of these guys. It's like six, eight thousand dollars. That's just way too much money. Besides, as I said, these guys don't care. So why are they building these trucks? Why are they making this emphasis? It's because the U.S. government is finally putting fuel economy standards on trucks. Now, one of the main reasons why we're buying so many more trucks over the last two and a half decades is because the U.S. government basically won't let the car makers build big V8-powered cars anymore. So people bought big V8-powered trucks. Car and Driver magazine once did a comparison, and they said that over the 25-year span of the so-called CAFE regulations, the total fleet vehicle average fuel economy didn't change. People bought more fuel-efficient cars, but bought way lots more less fuel-efficient trucks. So now they're trying to ram these vehicles, pardon the expression, down our throats. But I've said before, you don't like to hear this, but if the government wants us to buy more fuel-efficient vehicles, it's pretty simple. Make fuel more expensive. Let the market decide what kind of vehicle they want, a car or a truck, whatever. It's the only way to do it. Plus, it's simple. But of course, simplicity in governments don't usually mix. Oh, by the way, truckers, folding that tailgate down, leaving it down, thinking you're saving fuel economy? Ha! Mythbusters proved that doesn't work. I'm Jim Kenzie. So is the second generation B-Class better than the first? Yes, for several reasons. Love the new engine. The interior now feels like a Mercedes-Benz, and it does handle better, which was a big criticism from current B-Class owners. As to my question, why did they build it? Well, the answer is quite simple. It is a five-door hatch, and that's a very popular segment today. Now, though, take away some of the active safety bells and whistles on the Mercedes, and you could pick up, for example, a fully loaded Kia Forte for a lot less money. However, as one Mercedes executive once told me, when you purchase a Mercedes, 30% of that price is for the badge alone. So there you go. And before we go, make sure you check us out at motoringtv.com and join us on Facebook. Get in on the conversation. We want to hear from you. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. But there are some things going against it, primarily the fact that diesel is no longer cheap to buy. And so people are going to have to look at this carefully and say, yes, you get a longer range in it and you do get the good mileage, but it's a $5,000 premium to buy the engine.